All right. So let's get into this. We'll get uh, newcomers and all that after, uh, towards the end. Thank you. You're doing, doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, Exodus. So uh, let's continue part four of the tabernacle. Uh, last week we did part three. I didn't give you a subtitle last week. We talked about the altar and how animals were being slaughtered and there was this blood and, and that was just part of it. It all points us to Jesus dying on the cross for us, him shedding his blood. I didn't give you the subtitle for part three last week. If you want to write it down for, for part three last week, it was supposed to be called It's a Little Messy, which if you think about it, it goes in hand in hand. It's a Little Messy was last week. We're in part four. So let's read our main text, Exodus 25, eight through nine. And then it says, then... They uh, then, have the, then have them make a sanctuary for me. This is God speaking to Moses. We've been reading this. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. So a reminder to everyone that the Lord is speaking to Moses, telling Moses, this is how I want the tabernacle to look. I'm going to make this tabernacle a mobile tent, kind of a mobile sanctuary, a mobile church that I can travel. I will be with you. It will be my sign that I'm with you and the people. So... Don't forget, as we continue to move through the service, so far for the th first three weeks, we have been able to kind of point everyone in the direction of this point. Let's put it on the board that the tabernacle illustrates God's desire for relationship with people. All throughout this tabernacle, you're going to see these foreshadowing and all this pointing towards Jesus. And what's the heart of Jesus? The heart of Jesus is to be, is to save mankind. It's to have relationship with mankind. Same end of that. So everywhere in the tabernacle, we're seeing pictures of Jesus. And don't forget, as we go through the tabernacle, we see how God wants relationship with people through the blood of Jesus, through the laying down of the life of Jesus. Now, let me go ahead and give you the subtitle for this week. We're in week four. Let's put that on the board. It's called, We Have to Clean Up. We have to clean up, okay? We have to clean up is where we're at. You'll see why we call that as we move forward. Let's say a prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. According to Acts 2.42, your word will stay gladly. According to Acts 19.20, your word will prevail. I thank you now, Father God, that you use me, use these lips of clay to speak your word without errant excellence according to your desire. I pray now, Father, according to Matthew 10.20, even as I stand here, the spirit of my Father speak through me. According to John 6.63, your word is spirit in life today. And I thank you now, Father God, that all things are said according to your will and desire. For Lord, we've gathered here the truth of your word and not the opinion of man. So use these lips of clay to speak your word without error and excellence according to your desire. And we give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says? I'm going to tell you about two uh, people real quick. This is going to kind of lead us into where we're headed. There's two people called priest and the, and the high priest. It's really priest, plural. And then you have the high priest. How many know every any church, any business, any organization... Uh, especially the larger you get, you need help, right? You need employees, you need people, uh, volunteers if you're a church, you need people to help manage things, take care of things, keep things in order. Well, the tabernacle needed such people. The tabernacle needed servants, it needed workers, it needed people to help take care and keep order and lead the people through what they're doing. It needed people, it needed men to, to help take care of specific sacrifices and make sure certain things were done on certain days. These people were called the priests, plural, and the chief priest, which would be one person. Uh, the chief priest, you could say, is like the pastor of the church almost. He's the one who oversees the entire tabernacle. The priest would be, let's call them your volunteers, your laymen, your workers, your employees. They would be going around making sure everything was in order, everything was done right. You know, people are bringing these animals to be sacrificed. They're not just laying them by the fire, throw it in there, do whatever you want. These men are helping keep things in order, helping lead the people accordingly. Put it on the board, a few things the chief priest and priest will do. They served in the tabernacle. They assisted in and performed sacrifices like we talked about last week. Uh, one thing they did is they cleaned the furniture and the instruments of the tabernacle. They would wipe down and make sure everything was cleaned accordingly because things had to be kept clean in the tabernacle of God, almost like a church. Does it sound familiar? It also fulfilled duty. They also fulfilled duties inside the holy place and the most holy place. Can we go to the picture of the tabernacle real quick, Ivory? And uh, you hang with me because we'll be back and forth today. So here's... The uh, tent of meeting, some would call it. Some would actually refer to this as the, the tabernacle when they speak of it. Some say that, but we're referring to the tabernacle as a whole. This would be like the tent of meeting where, where the, chief, or the, the priest, I'll show you in the weeks to come, this room is divided in half. The priests were able to go into one half of it along with the chief priest. However, the chief priest was the only one allowed into the second half. So they would have access to this tent of meeting where they would go. And in that tent of meeting, there were certain duties that had to be done. They had to take care of the altar of incense. They had to light the candles on the, on the menorah. We'll get into those things. They had to take care of the table of showbread where they would even partake and eat in a type of communion almost. Uh, then in the most holy place where the, the altar, uh, where the mercy seat was, where the Ark of the Covenant was, it was the chief priest that had access to that 
all these areas had to be taken care of. So these people were needed. Let's go to that list of priests and high priests again. Let's do that to finish off. So they would fulfill the duties inside the holy place and most holy place, that tent of meeting I just showed you. And they were constantly, this is a big one, they were constantly outside. Tabernacle was not an indoor facility. It was an outdoor facility, as you've been learning and hearing. They were constantly outside, constantly in the elements, in the sun, constantly in the desert. There's sand, there's dirt. They were constantly outside. So the reason I want to bring these men up and, and we'll point to them as we go forward to the next couple weeks and close out this series. We're going to talk a little more about them, but I just need to highlight them because with everything I showed you, I think you would agree with me that I wouldn't necessarily call this a clean job, a little bit of a dirty job, a little bit of some, some dirty work. If you look at that list with me, I mean, they had clean furniture, assisted in performing sacrifices, constantly outside. Uh, you know, it wasn't exactly this, this, this uh, white collar job where you're, you're going to keep your hands clean. No, no. They, they, were, they were constantly getting dirty. And these servants of God regular were performing, regularly were performing their tasks. And it was not exactly this thing that was maybe the, the, the cleanest of things, but it's what they were called to do. They were of the tribe of Levi. We'll get into that later on. But with that in mind, I want to point you to our next kind of focal point in the tabernacle. And it's called the bronze laver. It's after the bronze altar, and it's very important. It's called the bronze laver. Let's go to Exodus 30. Let's read together in verse 17. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a bronze wash basin or a bronze laver with a bronze stand. Place it between the tabernacle and the altar and fill it with water. Aaron and his sons, Aaron and his sons, Aaron was the chief priest. Aaron would become the chief priest. His sons were the priests, as we just talked about, from the tribe of Levi. So Aaron, the chief priest, and his sons, the priests, will wash their hands and feet there. They must wash with water whenever they go into the tabernacle to appear before the Lord. And when they approach the altar to burn up their special gifts to the Lord, or they will die. So real quick, that little tent of meeting area. Can we go back to the tabernacle real quick? That little tent of meeting area that I was highlighting for y'all here. You go in there without stopping at the laver to clean and to wash yourself. You will die. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. God's just saying, God is saying, before they come into this holy place, the most holy of holies, you are not, you are not, if you are not clean, you will die. A little side point that, or a little side note I think is pretty cool. You know, we believe in three baptisms here at the church. Uh, and we preach that, we minister that. One baptism is into the body of Christ or in Jesus. That's getting saved. And we have a baptism in water, which is the water, which is your public announcement of faith. And then we have a, what we call baptism in the spirit. Jesus who baptizes you in the spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus. Disciples baptize you into water. And then finally, the Holy Spirit will baptize you in, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. It's funny, right? Because if you think about this, um, the reason I mention this is because we have baptisms coming up. All right, give a hand clap to all those who are going to get baptized at Comanche Park here soon. And the reason I'm saying, I'm not saying if you don't get baptized, you're going to die. I'm not saying that. But here's a thought. Isn't it interesting? Before they came into the presence of God, they had to be washed. And I tell people sometimes who've never been baptized that maybe if you feel like your life's a little dull or a little stale, maybe it's because you're not full of the life you need. That makes sense to everyone. It's not full of the life you need. You need Jesus. You, you need the word. You need. And I tell people, there's something about getting baptized in water that just brings life inside of you. And I think it's interesting that before you come into my presence, make sure you wash. So all that to say, if you're wondering if I should get baptized, pray no more. It's time to get baptized. Give them a hand clap, okay? I, I, I just throw that out to you real quick. We'll give you more information on that at the end of service. It's a side note. It wasn't here. But he's telling them. Make sure they do this or they will die. And then finally, verse 21, we can go back and finish, Ivory. They must always wash their hands and feet or they will die. This is a permanent law for Aaron and his descendants, for the chief priests and the priests to be observed from generation to generation. So the bronze laver, let's go back to the tabernacle. Is this piece of, art, a piece of furniture that we're talking about right in the middle between the altar and the tents of meeting? The altar here is where uh, forgiveness, the washing of blood, all these things. Think about that's your baptism in, that's your baptism to the body of Christ. That's getting saved. 
here's water baptism. And I could give you a whole teaching on this. And there's even this anointing part where the priests had to anoint themselves before they went to intensive meeting. It's a beautiful picture of how there's baptism in three phases, okay? But what I'm trying to get to you is this. This bronze laver sits in the middle of the tabernacle. It sits right there in the middle. And it's needed. It has a purpose. But it'll only be the priest and the chief priests that would wash themselves in this bronze laver. They're the ones performing the sacrifices, getting dirty. They're the ones to wash themselves. So a few things about this bronze laver from the verses we've gathered. Uh, can we go ahead and show a picture of it real quick? From the verses we gather, it's, this thing's very simple. That is not the greatest picture, but again, bear with me, okay? This, uh, go to this picture number two. So some people can't even really give a plain picture of what this thing actually looked like. And here's why. We just read in Exodus 17, uh, 30, 17 through 21, God doesn't give much detail on this. Go, go, to, go to the list. Let, let's read the list together. It's, it's made of bronze. The bronze laver is made of bronze. It holds water to be used by the priests for washing their hands and, the, and their feet while they serve in the tabernacle. It is placed in the middle of the outer court between the bronze altar and the tents of meeting. That's all. That, that's it. God, for, for whatever reason, he doesn't necessarily give the specifics that he gave about the outer court, about the, the white linen that would wrap around the tabernacle, not even about the tents of meeting where the most holy place and holy of holies is. The, the, the details of the bronze altar he gave, seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet by four and a half feet, but wrap it in bronze. Like, there's nothing really given of, the, of this bronze laver, and yet it sits in the middle of the tabernacle. So even though you may think and you read 17 through 21 in Exodus 30, think to yourself, well, there, there, there's not much detail there. There's not much given with, with the labor. We don't know much about it. But, but, but I submit to you, it's still an important part of the tabernacle. Uh, and, and I want to show you that today of, of why it's important, how it's important and how it relates to us. Because remember, you don't stop at uh, Aaron, you and your, your sons, your descendants, the chief priest, high priest. You don't stop at this labor to wash. We're going to have a problem. You don't stop here to clean yourself. We're going to have a problem. You don't stop here to rinse yourself off. You're going to die. So you can't tell me this is not important. So even though there's a lack of detail, there's importance here. So what's that importance relate to us? Well, let me show you Exodus 38 verse 8 a few chapters later. Bezalel made the bronze wash basin. So they're talking now about the bronze laver wash basin in Exodus 30. He made the bronze wash basin and its bronze stand from bronze mirrors donated by the women who served at the entrance of the tabernacle. Wait, stop. Bronze mirrors. I've showed you in other places so far posts wrapped in bronze, an altar of uh, the altar, the brazen altar wrapped in bronze, just bronze. And yet now God's saying, hey, wait a minute. The bronze laver, I want you to use bronze mirror for it. Use the bronze mirror for the tabernacle, for, for the laver in the tabernacle. See, this small verse can be overlooked, but, but it gives us key insight into the spiritual significance of the bronze laver. Put it on the board. The laver was made from the bronze mirror. That's the source it's coming from. So why is this significant? Why, why is this important? Because it's a detail we are given regarding the bronze laver. And by the way, you may wonder, how is bronze mirror? In these days, they, they didn't have these glass mirrors we're used to. So they would take precious metal like bronze, and they'd polish and polish and shine and shine and clean it up. And it gave you a reflection. So you ladies, it wasn't exactly maybe the glamorous you know, vanity you want. But it worked. It did the job. It, was, it worked. It, it did the purpose. And would, it would reflect. Hence, it would reflect. It would reflect. Hence the spiritual significance. What does a mirror do? A mirror reflects. It shows the person looking in the mirror who they are. Consider this. The priest used to wash themselves this giant mirror, basically, filled with water. That every time they come to this, this bronze laver, every time they come to wash, they could see their reflection in this mirror of bronze. Every time they came to clean themselves, they could see who they were. So I got a question for you. As we dive into this spiritual significant thought, how often do we look in the mirror? I know some of you are saying, I looked in the mirror like five, six times this morning. Yeah, I know. Some of you husbands looked, looked over at your wives for whatever reason I said that. But how many times do we look in the mirror? How often do we try to fix ourselves up, clean ourselves up? We need a mirror. Let's be honest. 
How many of you looked at least once in the mirror this morning? Raise your hand. All right, and if you did it, you got something on your face. I'm just like, listen, listen. Everyone looks in the mirror. My question is, how often do we look in the mirror? And I keep asking that question because of this. I don't mean a natural mirror. I mean a spiritual mirror. I mean a spiritual mirror. You may be wondering, what, what spiritual mirror are you talking about? James chapter 1. Let's read together. CEV version. Obey God's message. Don't fool yourselves by just listening to it. That's the verse that sounds familiar to you that says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. Verse 23. If you hear the message of God, the message of the word, and don't obey it, you are like people who stare at themselves in a the mirror and forget what they look like as soon as they leave. But you must never stop looking at the perfect law, that is the word of God, the message of God, that sets you free. God will bless you in everything you do if you listen and obey and don't just hear and forget. James is telling us that the Bible is our mirror. It's our spiritual mirror. So hence my question once again, how often are you looking into your spiritual mirror? Question, did you think God just wrote the Bible for fun? Do you think God just told men, pen this together just for kicks? Do you think God told these men, I want you to write 66 books, 39 in the old, 27 in the new, Old Testament in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek, line them up in perfect order so that I can deliver a message of perfection to the people of God, not necessarily chronologically in order, but in the order that I tell you, that's how we're going to place it. Do you think God just did this because he was thinking, eh, I want to be published? No. It's purpose behind it. There's reasoning behind it. So... I have this thought and I want to tell you, the word of God is our spiritual mirror. The word of God is what we are to look into daily. Notice how the priest and the high priest could see themselves in the bronze labor that, the, the, that they made and put in the tabernacle. They look into it and they could see their reflection. They could see themselves. Well, we can see ourselves in the mirror of the word. You can see yourself in the mirror of the Bible. And you may say, well, what am I looking at? Well, I'll tell you right now. The Bible helps us to see who we are, and the Bible helps us to see who we are not. The Bible helps you to see this is what's good that you're doing, and the Bible will help you to see this is what you're doing that's not good and you need to stop. The Bible will show you you're not doing this and you need to start doing it. The Bible will say you're doing this and we have a problem if you keep doing it. It's like a mirror. Fix yourself. The hair is out of place. Need to fix my makeup. Need to do this to my eyes. I got wrinkles. I want to go get liposuction. Whatever you want, God bless you. Do, do liposuction work for wrinkles? I don't know. You know what I mean. Like, whatever. Botox. Thank you. Botox. Lip fillers. No, but you're starting like that. Walk around like that, right? Like, like, like you just like, I want to look better. I don't like the way I look in the mirror. I don't like the way I'm, I'm, I'm presenting myself. Question. You should not always like what you, not question, statement. You should not always like what you read in the Bible. I know that sounds weird to some people. What do you mean? No, no. It should hit you sometimes hard. Like, what? God, you want me to do that? You want me to love my neighbor as myself? You want me to forgive those who've hurt me, bless those who persecute me? You want me to do these things? It should sometimes bother you a little bit. Just the way you look in the mirror, like, oh. Like, it's some of y'all maybe don't do that. I do, but that's fine. It's like, oh, like, what is that? What is that? Yeah, that's the Bible sometimes. But question, how often are we looking into it? We're, we, we need to, to, to look in the Bible to see who we are and who we are not. So like a mirror, look at me. Are you looking into the word of God daily? Are you looking into the Bible daily? Are you looking into the, the mirror of scripture daily? Church, you and I look into a mirror to adjust our appearance but we should look into the word of God, our spiritual mirror, to adjust our lives. Because in the end, when we stand before God, it's not our outer appearance he's going to look at. It's going to be our heart he's looking at. And you know what helps you get your heart in order? The word of God. You know what helps tell you your heart's not in the right place? The word of God. Isn't it interesting? The most important book, of, uh, the most important book we'll ever lay our hands on sometimes gets the dustiest in our house. Sometimes goes the least open in our home. It's sometimes the, the, the book we least share with our family and our children. And yet the Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go. That's according to the word of God. 
The Bible says, do not let this book of the law depart out of your mouth, out of your heart. The Bible says to study this word day and night. Let it be a part of you. Write the scriptures of it on the tablet of your heart. Put this word deep into your heart. Let it be the seed in your heart that produces fruit. And yet, we don't look into it enough. We don't observe it enough. And I'm guilty of it too. And yet, the chief priest, look at Before they could go and experience the beautiful presence of God, God said, stop at the brazen labor, wash yourself, look into the bronze mirror and see what's going on in your heart. See what's going on. See how dirty you are. Church, if we ever really truly want to experience the beauty of God's presence, we need to daily be looking into the word of God so that we can examine our lives and say, Lord, whatever is hindering me from having the absolute most beautiful experience of walking with you, I want to get rid of it out of my life. I want it. I want it out. I need it to go. I want it gone out of my life. And you're wondering, well, what should I be doing, not be doing? It's all in the word of God. Some people say, I want to hear God's voice. Open your Bible. That's the word of God. Some people say, I want to change. Open up the Bible. That Bible will transform your mind and transform your hearts. That, some people will say, I, I, need, I, need, I need my wife to change, my husband to change, I need my kids to change. Open up the Bible, see what the scripture says, and start declaring those scriptures over your family's life. There's power in this word, church, because it helps us to see what we need to see. It helps us to realize what we don't realize. So if you're ever wondering, why does my life seem like it's not really going in a good direction, things aren't changing, I have a question for you. How, how daily are you looking into the word of God? Because when God has spoken to us, our ears should be open every day to see what he has to say. Church, I love you and I am guilty of it, but I'll tell you the truth right now. If we're not in the word, we will be, if we're not in the word, we will end up in the world. Say amen to that. They may say, well, I'm doing all right. All right, or are we doing awesome with God? Are we growing in the Lord? See, it's interesting. The bronze laver actually delivers kind of a hard message to us, a tough message to us. Do you see your reflection in the mirror of God's word? Do you see your reflection in what he's trying to say in his scripture? We'll talk about more of that in a second. But in the tabernacle, also the laver that reflected, listen, the same laver, let's move on to the next one. The same laver that reflected was also the same laver that was used to wash. One more time, let me say it again. The same laver that reflected was the same laver that was used to wash. The same laver that reflected was the same laver that was used to wash. The priest and the high priest would repeatedly come to the labor to wash their hands and feet, not only of the blood and fragments of whatever they sacrificed, but they would also wash themselves simply of the dust that they were picking up while working in the tabernacle, washing their hands and their feet. God did not want the priest and the high priest, listen, God did not want the priest and the high priest serving him with uncleanness. God did not want the high priest and the chief, I'm sorry, the chief priest and the, and the priest serving him with uncleanness. Church. It's the same for us today. God does not want us serving him with uncleanness. And you may think to yourself, what kind of uncleanness are you talking about? I'm not necessarily, listen, I'm not necessarily talking about the deep, ugly sin of your past. I'm not necessarily talking about that. And you may say, well, then what are we getting at? Well, let me first tell you this. The same labor that reflected was the same labor that washed. That put it on the board. The same Bible that helps you see yourself is the same Bible that washes you. The same Bible that helps you see yourself is the same Bible that washes you. <laughs> the other day, um, I was, at, I was at, a, at a restaurant, and this is my kind of the TMI or whatever, but um, I had sneezed. And then um, I was just there sitting down. I was eating by myself some lunch. And um, I just, before I left, I said, I'm going to go to the restroom real quick. <laughs> when I went to the restroom, um, I had like this, this booger just hanging in my, in my beard here. And I was like, I've been talking to servers the whole time I've been here. No, nobody said anything to me. And I was like, okay, it, but funny, I didn't notice it till what? I looked in the mirror. And as I looked at the mirror, there was the water to wash myself. What's beautiful about the Bible, it's not just going to tell you what's wrong. It's going to tell you, let's clean this up. Let me tell you how to clean this up. Let me help you clean this up. God's a good God. Yes, he rebukes and he disciplines, but he tells you, hey, but let me help you get it right. Any of y'all ever had a boss that just told you everything you did wrong and never really told you, like, well, this is what you need to do? I got to be careful because my dad used to be on boss. I'm not talking about him. I'm not talking about him. But you ever had any manager or anybody that sometimes like that? Well, if I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing it right, then what do I do? I'm so grateful to God he's not like that. He says, man, you got something on you. Oh, no. 
let me help you get rid of that. Let me show you a verse. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives. You must love them as Christ loved the church. He gave his life for it. So he's taking this example of husbands loving their wives, and now he's going to relate it to the church in verse 26. What did Christ do? Christ did this. He loved his, he gave his life for the church. He did this so he could set the church apart for himself. That is sanctify the church. He made it clean by the washing of water with the word. Let's say it together, the highlighted words on the count of three. One, two, three. By the washing of water with the word. Christ did this so the church might stand before him in shining greatness. There is to be no sin of any kind in it. It is to be holy without blame. Or some may remember the version that says without spot or wrinkle. Church, by the washing of water with the word. By the washing of water with the word. By the washing of water with the word. Let me try to break this down for you a little bit. Remember, I'm not just talking about sin in life because it's interesting. When they would sacrifice the animal that represented sin, what would be left on their hands sometimes? Fragments of the animal, pieces of the animal. God's saying, don't come into my presence with that sin in your life. Make sure we wash it off. But there was dirt they collected. You know, simple things. Get, get rid of the, anything unclean. Get it out of your life. So let's just take a little talk here. How much natural dirt do we accumulate throughout the day? Just regular dirt, regular germs. I mean, some of you maybe are germaphobes. You don't want to touch the handle with the door handle with your hand. You're trying to grab it with whatever, okay? No judgment. Some of us, we sanitize daily, wash our hands 10 times a day. We are, uh, you know, scrubbing, cleaning our house everywhere we go. Some of you carry your own sanitation wipes probably. And wipe down the tables at the restaurant. It would be whatever you do. Why? Because you know there's dirt, there's grime, there's germs. Those things are around everywhere. How much natural dirt do we accumulate day to day? Only God knows, really, right? Question. How much spiritual dirt do we accumulate? You may think to yourself, like, well, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm around a good crowd most of the day. I'm listening to my Christian music all day and have sermons in my ear all day. You know, you know your flesh is a never-ending consumer of the buffet of sin? That's pretty good. You need to write that down. That wasn't in my notes. Your flesh is a never-ending consumer of the buffet of sin. It just, your flesh catches everything that's not of God. So the gossip you heard amongst your coworkers, the lies you heard maybe through TV, radio, or even at home, the, the filth that you're picking up day to day, church, I'm telling you right now, you don't even realize sometimes what your flesh is catching and what's trying to go into you, not just stay on your body, but it's even trying to get into your home. You picked up something bad, you overheard some guys, men at work talking ugly and vulgar, that, that you, you heard it in your ears. Women, you heard women maybe bashing their husbands or fam. That got picked up in your ears. You college kids going about, you hear professors saying junk in their classrooms. That's not of God. You may say that's not true, but it's still, it's, it's there. It's, it's kind of that dirt that accumulates. It's there. Funny. We are so, so sometimes even scared to walk around with dirty hands, and yet you don't realize it sometimes, but you're picking up all this junk in your flesh, and your spirit's like, we need to wash that off. We need to get rid of that. Why? Because like any of you good moms will know, get your son or daughter to go clean those hands and wash those hands. Why? Because germs are just going to accumulate. Germs are just going to accumulate. Germs are just going to accumulate. More germs, more germs, more germs. And on top of that, don't come hug me with those germs either, right? They're just going to get on you more and more and build up. Build up, build up, build up. And I'm telling you now, if you're not careful, the lies of the word, the, the, the world, the gossip, gossip of the world, the junk of the world will accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And if you don't come before the Lord and get in his word, you will accumulate that junk. And the next thing you know, you start talking different. You start acting a little different. You get around your coworkers at work and say, hey, Charlie, dude, I know. Also, you start talking like them and everything. And next thing you know, like, where did that come from? And God's saying, you allow too much junk to build up in your flesh and now your spirit's trying to tell you we got to get rid of it it's very practical if you think about it and you may say to yourself am i really picking up junk we pick up junk every day out there in the world some of us pick up junk in our home sometimes it's what happens good news 
We have the word to help wash the junk of the world, the junk off our flesh, the junk that we are taking in sometimes and we don't even realize we're taking it in. So when these men would come to the labor, they'd scrub, they'd wash themselves and wash themselves. Just the way we come to the word and open up the word, you know what the word will do? The word washes us just like water washes or cleanses us, so does the word. So church, I tell you right now, <laughs> We need to daily bathe ourselves in the word of God. Have you ever come home with mud or dirt on you? Maybe some grass from cutting the yard, men. What do you do? Get in that shower. Don't, tra <laughs> Don't track that junk through my house. Some of us need to realize I can't be tracking this spiritual junk through my house. I need to wash myself. You know what washes you? The word of God. It's the washing of the water of the word church I am fascinated we are quick to wash in the natural but sometimes slow to wash in the spiritual and yet it's not the germs of the world that will send us to hell it is the junk of the world that will consume our hearts and minds and bring us into a life of sin that will send us to hell church if I'm going to serve God daily like these priests and chief priests I should desire to be cleansed daily I should desire to be washed daily. Some of you people here have some tough jobs and tough lines of work. Let's be honest, some of you have lines of work, especially men have jobs where you're just a bunch in front of a bunch of vulgarity and just a bunch of horrible things being said all day. Be careful, you don't just track that with you and take and have it carrying inside of you or have it on you like, like, a, like a stink on you. Church, we need to get in the word. I, I didn't bring my Bible out. I have it in my office. But I, and some people say, why don't you have a Bible and preach? Well, because we're on a clock and I don't want it to be turning page to page. So it's all right here. I promise. It's right. I have like 27 Bibles in here too. Okay. So this is, but this is like the Bible. And you know what it is? It's like water. Just wash your shoes. You just got to, you just got to, you know, you got to get in. Right. You just got to. Switch, 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 switch. And, and the funny thing is that the, the Bible, that, that's what God wants us to do daily. Can I challenge you with something? Before you close your eyes and go to sleep, read a few verses. Get some word in you. Maybe even after you do it, whether it's with your phone or your iPad or Bible, just do it for fun after you read some verses. Say, thank you, Lord. Scrub hard around your heart. I don't want that. Scrub hard around your head. Get that junk out of my mind. I don't want that in me. Get in the word, and that word washes us. It'll help purify us. It'll help clean us. Do you see the significance of the labor here? Where God is saying to the, chief, the priest and the chief priest, go wash yourself. Because if you want to serve me effectively, I want you to have clean hands and a pure heart. I want you to be a clean person. So church, yes, God, I confess my sin daily to you. But Lord, any other thing, any other junk that's tried to penetrate my heart... In the name of Jesus, I'm going to read the word and I'm going to declare I have the mind of Christ. I'm going to declare that I have a heart that is after following the Lord God Almighty. I have a heart that's clean and pure. That I'm going to confess and say today that my mouth shall speak words of life and not of death. You confess those things as you read them in the word. What I'm trying to get to you today, church, is pretty simple as we close this up. What I'm trying to tell you today is a practical message. One to let you know how important the word of God is. How much we need the word. And in the end, I tell you, the labor points to Jesus. The labor points to Jesus. How does it so? Well, the word of God is a mirror and water. Say mirror. mirror. Say water. water. Say the word. I'm a, let, let me show you John 1.1. 1, 1. Well, actually, before we show that, stay there. The mirror, the word of God is a mirror and water. And what if I told you, therefore, Jesus Christ is a mirror and water. John 1.1, 1, 1, put on the board, New Life Version. The word Christ was in the beginning. The word was with God and the word was God. There you go. I like math. I'm going to show you a math equation. Put it on the board. If the word of God equals a mirror and water, then Jesus equals a mirror and water. It, it, that's math. Don't look at me funny. Some of you got your, got your pencils right now. 
carry Jesus, carry the word. What? No, no just, just, just look at the equation. Just look at the equation. The word is Jesus. And if the word is mirror and water, well, then Jesus is the mirror and water. Church, Jesus is the mirror I am looking into when I look into the word of God. Did you, listen, did you not know that when you look into your word, you're looking into Jesus? That when you spend time in your word, you're spending time with Jesus? Question, how much time are you spending with Jesus? How much time are you spending in the word? Jesus is the image I want to reflect. Say reflect. He's the image I want to reflect. So question, how much of Jesus do you see in yourself when you look into the word? How much of Jesus do you see in yourself when you look into the word? Do you see compassion and love? Do you see humility and gentleness? Are you seeing truthfulness and kindness, service and sacrifice? How much of Jesus are you seeing in your life as you look into the word? And I'm not saying you should see perfection because only Jesus is perfect. However, we should see some of Jesus in our lives. There should be something happening inside of us. When he says, love your neighbor yourself, you know what, God, I'm getting better at that. Thank you, Lord. When he says, uh, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another, well, Lord, I probably need to get a little better at that. When it says to serve those that are less fortunate, well, God, uh, I'm, I want to start doing that better. When it says to speak truth in all things, okay, God, I'm doing better at that. I've cut out the line in my life. How much of Jesus are you seeing in your life? You know it by when you get into the mirror of the word. So simply put, and we'll wrap this up. When I look into the mirror of the word, my goal is to look more and more like Jesus. That's my goal. That's my goal. I want to look more and more like Jesus. And I could come up here and preach a hard message to you and tell you about how horrible you are and how horrible the world is and why can't you get it right and why can't you stop sinning in your life. And, why, and I can do it. Trust me, I can, I, can, I can preach you to hell if you want. But you know what I'd rather do? Preach the same message and give you and let you know simply, you need to straighten out some things in your life, get into the word of God. Get into the word of God. Read the word of God, because I want to look more and more like Jesus. Ladies, can I have a quick word with you, quick chat with you? I, I can ask a question. Do you ever have a look that's inspired? I saw this on TV or a magazine. I saw this person with their hair like this or wearing this wardrobe on Tic Tac. I mean, Tic Tac, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I see all these things happening. And I, I see that color. Oh, my God, it's the new color of fall. Okay, fine, cool. Like, there, there's, there's like an inspiration sometimes behind how you dress yourself and look and something you saw. You know who's the inspiration for our life? Jesus Christ. What do I want to look like? I want to look like Jesus. How do I want to live? I want to live like Jesus. Get into the mirror, see Jesus, and say, how much am I looking like Jesus? How much am I behaving like Jesus? But not only that, he's the water that I am cleansed with. Church. Words do not cleanse you. A person cleanses you. More of Jesus is more of the word. And more of Jesus can rid us of the filth that falls on us. It can only be Jesus who is the word who can rid us of this filth. You ever realize, worship team, come up. You ever realize <laughs> you don't bathe in something that makes you dirtier. You don't bathe in things that are going to make you worse off than what you are, going to make you dirtier than what you are. Any of you parents ever told your kids, go wash in that motor oil? Go clean yourself in the mud. Like, well, you, no, you don't bathe yourself in things that make you dirtier. You bathe in what cleanses you. In church, the filthiness of the world can only be cleansed by the pure water of the word. The filthiness of the world can only be cleansed by the pure water of the word. Because the word is absolutely pure because Jesus is absolutely pure. And only absolute purity can wash away absolute filth. Say amen to that. Let me say it one more time. Say it with me. Only absolute purity. All right, let's be a better class. All right, stay with me. Only absolute purity can wash away absolute filth. The word is pure, which means Jesus is pure. We don't have to be unclean, church. We need to keep washing ourselves with the word. You know, part of relationship, worship team come up, part of relationship, I would say 
is wanting the absolute best for the person you're in relationship with. I hope this never happened, but husbands or wives, you ever looked at each other, ever looked at each other and say, I just hope you have the worst day. I just hope every light is red. I just hope that your boss yells at you 10 times today. And I just hope that the meal that I cook for you hurts your stomach later. <laughs> Please don't go around doing that. <laughs> I, think, I think part of relationship is looking at one another and saying, I want what's absolutely best for you. I, I want you to be happy, joyful. I want you to feel fulfilled, live with purpose. I want you to be healthy and well. I, I want what's absolutely best for you. Church, our Father in heaven wants what is absolutely best for us. He wants what is best. There's not a day we wake up and God looks at us and says, oh, I'm going to get you today good. Every day we wake up and he says, there's the apple of my eye. There's the one that I love more than they will ever understand. There's the one that I will move whatever I need to move to let them know that I love them more than they could ever imagine. You wake up in the morning and you know who's happier than anyone else that you're awake? God Almighty. He's so happy to spend another day with us. We couldn't even fathom the joy of his heart that he has to see his child alive and serving. He wants what is absolutely best for us because that's the type of relationship he has with us. Church, our Father wants what is absolutely the best for us. And I tell you today, our Father wants us to be cleansed of everything that contaminates us so that we can reflect the image of Jesus as we serve Him on this earth. He wants us to be blessed. He needs us to be cleansed. He wants us to serve Him with with, with righteousness and hope and holiness and, and anointing and love. He wants to wash us with his word daily. He wants to show us this is what's not right. Not because I hate you, because I love you. And I want you to change some things in your life. See, the tabernacle illustrates God's desire for relationship with us. And at the bronze laver, you quickly find out, oh man, my God wants what's best for me. He wants me to be cleansed, and he wants me looking more and more like his son every day. Church, I say this to close it out. With that in mind, Jesus is the image I want to reflect and the water I need to be cleansed so my relationship can flourish as I daily serve God.